The last couple of weeks, we've had trouble connecting to connecting Zoom to Facebook. So what we've done is, you know, Zoom always seems to work perfectly fine. So we record our videos here. And then uh, if we're able to connect to Facebook, we live stream. If we're not able to connect to Facebook, we just record it here and then we post it up the next morning. Um, so, you know, it'll be, it'll, the video will actually live on YouTube, but we'll put a link to that video on YouTube on Facebook and on Twitter and in all the different groups and people can share it and stuff like that so that people can still get this information even if they're not sort of consuming it live like we all are now. Um, so what I thought I would do today, the title of the, of the, of the presentation tonight is this, is optimization of heart brain axis signaling improves mental and physical performance. And that's a little bit wordy uh, compared to the typical topics that we have. Uh, and the reason for that is that this is the title of a presentation that was supposed to be made at the American College of Sports Medicine meeting this week in San Francisco. Um, but like all the scientific conferences and like all the you know, big meetings these days, that's all, that's all being canceled because of uh, COVID-19. So uh, I'm gonna be able to present this to you guys tonight. And then later on this week, we're gonna upload um, uh, a very, 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 very similar version of, of what you're seeing tonight um, up, to, uh, up, to those, up to those pages. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, we'll have, a, we'll have a virtual conference, okay? So you, know, you could also think of this as a mental heart deep dive because this particular scientific topic is all about mental heart. It's a clinical trial that we did last year that we're, that we're presenting, or that we, you know, we're, we're going to present this week, okay? So let me get rolling on here and we can, we can talk about this. So uh, just as a reminder, May is still Mental Health Awareness Month. So what is it? It's the 26th. Um, we've got one more uh, uh, science product call next Thursday is gonna be also a mental health, uh, uh, mental health topic. And you know, because it's Mental Health Awareness Month, it's, it's a great opportunity to just reach out to someone that you know to, to raise this question with them. You know, would they like to feel better in terms of their energy or their focus or their mood or their stress resilience or their ability to relax or their ability to get good quality sleep? Those are all things that fall under the umbrella of mental wellness. Um, and so it would have been lovely to be in San Francisco this entire week at the ACSM meeting. So ACSM is American College of Sports Medicine. I've been going to these ACSM meetings since I was in graduate school working on my master's degree. So my master's degree is in exercise science, specifically exercise physiology and exercise biochemistry. Um, and you know, I, I, I started going to these meetings in Gosh, when did I start my master's degree? I graduated from college in 89. So 90, 91, something like that. I've been going to this, these, these conferences for a long, long time. Um, in fact, I've been a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine for a long, long time. Um, and then, you know, after I did the sports, sports medicine stuff for a while, I kind of shifted gears more into nutrition and, you know, nutritional biochemistry and nutritional psychology and the things that I typically talk to you guys about on these, on these Tuesday and Thursday night calls. But it's, uh, it would have been, been a lovely week, you know, being there talking about sort of this topic tonight is how we can use mental fitness to improve physical fitness. And I know that that would have resonated really, really well with the audience at ACSM because at ACSM, you get a lot of sports medicine docs, you get a lot of uh, physical trainers, you get a lot of coaches, you get a lot of like, you know, the, um, Olympic training center crowd and you know things like that people who are trying to figure out how we can improve physical performance you know and the the hottest way to improve physical performance these days you know to get the most out of your body is to get the most out of your mind and use your mind to fuel that physical performance so you know like i said i've been presenting here for years and i you know i just i was very excited to present this particular data. Um, but it wasn't gonna be me, be, be, be me presenting all of it. You, you'll, you'll notice here, here's the, here's the title of our, of our presentation, of our, of our research, same as what the you know, title of tonight is, Optimization of Heart Brain Axis Signaling Improves Mental and Physical Performance. Uh, and we'll get into the nuances of you know, what exactly that means and how we measure it and things like that. But you'll notice the three authors on this paper are me as the, as the last author, um, uh, Lindsay Fawcett, uh, uh, Dr. Fawcett, is, uh, is, um, 
is a physician who's on our medical advisory board at Amare. Uh, she's based at, um, out, out, out at, um, at uh, California Health Sciences University College of Osteopathic Medicine. Uh, and, then, and then this person here, Courtney Talbot, that's my daughter. She's a junior um, at Cal Poly studying nutrition. Uh, and she'll probably go, she, you know, after she finishes her senior year, she'll probably go get a master's degree and a, and a registered dietetics degree um, and then go into some aspect of, of nutrition, whether it's counseling people or it's doing research or it's doing product development or something like that. It's kind of cool to have her, um, you know, following in my footsteps in a, in a, in a, you know, in a certain way. But what, what Lindsay and Courtney did out there at Cal Poly was really con conducted a lot of the data gathering that you're going to see in this study. Um, so, you know, part of what I'll present tonight are data that we collected here at our laboratory in Salt Lake City. Some of it you'll see was collected um, at uh, Dr. Fawcett's clinic in, um, in the San Luis Obispo area of California, sort of, you know, cent central coast area. And we'll walk you through and, and, and explain to you what we found. So what I'm going to do is I'm going I'm to go back and forth between um, each of the different parts of our abstract that we submitted and that was peer reviewed and was accepted to be presented at this at this ACSM conference, going back and forth between each part of those of that abstract, which is going to be the objective and the methods and the results and the conclusions. But in between each of those pieces, I want to I want to sort of flesh it out for you a little bit and share some background about why we decided to look at what we did, how we looked at it who we looked at, why we thought it was important, and really how we're using this research to break really interesting new ground around this whole idea of mental wellness. Like we made some really, really cool discoveries over the year or so that we were going down this research path, right? And it wasn't just as simple as throwing some ingredients into a formula and then feeding it to people and seeing what we got. There was a long path to get to where we actually got to test what we actually tested. So I want to give you guys a background for that because we've got a whole hour together tonight. So here's the, here's the objective that we went through. Um, the, Oh, I am live on Facebook. Diane, thank you for saying that. That's awesome because it didn't look like it was connecting. So I appreciate you giving me that heads up. Um, all right. So here's our objective. Dynamic changes in heart rate. And what I'm going to do is just read, read to you what's on here and then sort of, you know, give, give my commentary as we go. Dynamic changes in heart rate variability, or HRV, are considered as markers for autonomic nervous system balance. So that autonomic nervous system is sort of like your unconscious... Um, R relaxing part of your nervous system. That'll become more clear when I show you some graphs in just a second. Um, and psychological mood states, including depression, anxiety, overtraining, and burnout. So I'll show you how we measure heart rate variability in a little bit, but you can think of heart rate va variability as a way to measure not just your heart's stress and your heart's resilience, but that as a marker for the, for the stress levels and the resilience levels that are, that are system-wide. Because your heart, in a, in, a, in a lot of ways, you can think of your heart as, the, as like a central brain, and we call it a third brain, for not just your cardiovascular system, but also your nervous system. So it's a really, really interesting way to measure the level of stress and the level of recovery that an organism is under. We use heart rate variability these days. You can actually, I, I didn't plan on this, but you can see I'm wearing two watches right now. Both of these watches will measure heart rate variability. And I, and I, and we, you know, sometimes we use them in research trials to judge what is the stress that we're putting a particular subject under and how is that subject recovering from that stress? Um, so heart rate variability is a very, very interesting marker that we can use. So the reason it's important for us here while we're focusing on mental wellness is because of this. Heart rate variability is reduced in both depression and heart disease, suggesting a common physiological mechanism. Now we've known for a while that depression and heart disease are related to each other. I'll come back to this idea 
idea in a little bit to explain it a little bit more. But you know, we knew that that you know these two conditions are related, and we know that heart rate variability is reduced in both of those. So that might be a good way to measure both ends of this: a physiological kind of a condition like heart disease and a psychological kind of condition like depression are very very interlinked and intertwined. So reduced heart rate variability suggests poor stress adaptation, while increased heart rate variability is associated with vigor. So you guys have probably heard me talk about vigor before. That's the, that's the area of psychology research that I've specialized in for the last 20 years or so. When we measure vigor, its opposite state is burnout. And so we could, you know, either we, 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 we could measure vigor going up or burnout going down or vice versa. They're sort of, you know, opposite, opposite sides of the coin. And vigor is defined as a three-tiered sustained mood state characterized by physical energy, mental acuity, and emotional well-being. All wrapped up into one, that's vigor. Now we can measure things like fatigue separately, and we can measure focus separately, and we can measure something called um, a, a, a glo global mood state separately. And those are all measured just slightly differently. Vigor is a conglomeration of all of those together. And so that, in a lot of ways, that's how people want to feel. When people don't feel good, they very often are describing a lack of vigor. Um, in, 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 in fact, in traditional Chinese medicine, vigor is called qi. People have heard that term before. Qi is this kind of life force in the body. And if you have good qi, you're not just energetic and you're not just focused and clear-minded. You have this sort of unique kind of motivational kind of energy. Like you want to use that good feeling to do something with it. It's not just feeling good. It's being motivated to, 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 to put that energy into something. So it's a really, really nice, nice, um, nice measurement. And we can measure it very reproducibly using some, using some tools that I'll describe in a little bit. So this study assessed the effects of nutritional supplementation on this idea of the heart brain axis. So we're doing something in the heart, the third brain, as a, as a, well, I was just about to say it, as, as a means to an end of helping us feel better in the brain. But what we found, and that's, that's kind of where we got to, uh, but what we found was there are, there are distinct physical benefits of doing something in the heart. And what we discovered was there are also these mental benefits of doing something in the heart. So that's the heart-brain axis, whereby nutrition may play an impact on physical and psychological parameters in a coordinated manner. You know, so up until this study, um, which we did, uh, which we did just about a year ago, you know, this is this is this is why research takes so long, right? We collected these data last year, 2019. And then we had to analyze the data. Then we had to submit the data to a peer reviewed scientific conference. Then the conference had to accept those data and invite us to come present. And then we would have gone and made the presentation this week. So like a whole year for that, for that data to get out there in the world. Um, and so, you know, we, we at Amari kind of jumped the gun a little bit, right? We got the good data and we went, oh my gosh, this is amazing. We can make this into a product. And we made that into a product and we launched that product meant to heart last September. Right, so here we are in May, five, six, seven, eight, nine months ago. Right, so that product has been on the market, delivering goodness and delivering benefits to people for nine months before the data really sees the light of day. And that's you know, there's reasons for that. Right, the data has to be vetted. It has to be you know, it, other scientists have to look at it. They have to comment on it. Like all that kind of stuff. All that's important stuff. But boy, it's a slow process when you're when you're trying to help as many people as possible. Okay, so you know I'll 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 come back to some of those points in a little bit. But th this isn't a, this part right here is not a new idea. The idea that the heart and the brain are somehow linked to each other, that's not new. We've known that since the 1950s. You know there have been really good observations clinically that people who are depressed tend to have more heart attacks and people who have had heart attacks tend to be more depressed. And so, you know, there have been all kinds of reasons or, or all, all kinds of explanations for why that linkage might exist, you know, and, and 
a lot of them have kind of come back to this idea of, of, you know, people with heart disease have a lot of inflammation, people with depression have a lot of inflammation. Well, that's probably it. It's probably a biochemical linkage, right? And th th that, was, that was kind of what I thought up until fairly recently, right? I'm a nutritional biochemist. I could look at that and go, yeah, inflammation and cytokines and yeah, it makes logical sense. But there always seemed to be something more, like when you peel back the onion, it, inflammation is absolutely involved, but there seemed like there was more going on here than just an inflammatory cascade being out of whack. That is absolutely part of it. But what we found is that there's even more at play here. When we start talking about the heart and the signals that it sends, you know, the heart, you know, can create a lot of things. It can, it can create hormones like oxytocin. It can create um, it, 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 can, it can make its own cytokines. It can, make, it can make a whole bunch of different things. But the, the information that the heart sends out is primarily electrical in nature. And so the heart, the reason we call the heart the third brain is because it is a, it, it is a dense collection of neurons, the same kinds of, of nervous system cells that are in the brain um, in, in the you know, billions and billions the same kind that are in the gut, why we call the gut the second brain in the enteric nervous system, you know, not billions, but millions. And then in the heart, it's not billions or millions, but it's thousands, you know, tens of thousands, maybe, maybe 40 or 50,000. So it's a dense, dense enough collection of neurons that it legitimately can be called a brain in and of itself. And that brain, every time it contracts, it sends out these, these electrical waves that we can measure as heart rhythms. And so what, you, what you're seeing here is a fairly complicated uh, uh, cartoon showing that th there, are, there are electrical signals that go out from and back to the third brain, the heart. And some of those are kind of um, stimulatory signals, sympathetic signals, and some of them are relaxation signals, parasympathetic uh, uh, um, um, signals. And you want to have a balance of those. Sometimes when you want your heart to be doing more work, you want more sympathetic. When you want your heart to relax and recover, you want more parasympathetic. So you always want to have a balance between those and be able to dynamically adjust, you know, on the fly, when you're stressed, when you're relaxed, when you need to be calm, when you need to be vigilant, you know, that kind of stuff. And so we can measure the electrical activity going back and forth, you know, in through through all these through all these signals. When we measure them in the brain, we call them brain waves. When we measure them in the heart, we call them heart beats or heart rhythms. And the interval between those beats, that's the heart rate variability. And I think I, I think I have a graph of that in just a, in just a little bit. So we know that this, we know that these electrical signals go back and forth. We know that they carry a lot of really important information. We know that we want to have a balance between what the sympathetic nervous system is doing versus what the parasympathetic nervous system is doing. You can think of an, 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 another way to describe this is that the sympathetic nervous system is the gas pedal. Let me do it this way so that, it, so that it's on the right side of the screen, is the gas pedal, the rev up, and the parasympathetic is the brake. What you don't want to do is have your foot on the gas and the brake at the same time. That's where we get into a lot of problems. That's where we get into these stress-mediated kinds of chronic stress problems, catabolic situations, tissue breakdown situations, and inability to recover from stress. And so we want to be able to operate both of those um, independently, but also in a, in a coordinated manner. So you can see things like this. Um, sympathetic speed up the heart rate. Uh, parasympathetic slow down the heart rate. Um, uh, in the gut, sympathetic activity increases motility, meaning, meaning you're, you, you know, things move through your gut faster. Um, the parasympathetic is to, is to um, oh, I'm sorry, other, other, other way around, decrease motility, increase motility. These are some of the reasons that when we're stressed out, we get signals that will either slow down or speed up our gut. And that's, and that's not, not what we want. Sometimes this is also called, this parasympathetic side is sometimes called rest and digest, that we want to you know, really be able to calm down. We want to be able to build. We want to be able to recover versus the sympathetic side is, is, is about kind of um, 
uh, 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 you know, going and driving and, 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 and being on the fight or flight, you know, side. So we want to have a, both are important, but we want to have a balance between the two of them. And heart rate variability is a really, really good way to see what side you're dominating on. Uh, we'll use it with athletes sometime to try to see, are these athletes, um, are they recovering adequately from the stress that we're putting them under? So, you know, it, it, it's especially good in a, in a team setting because in a team setting, you know, all the athletes are doing the same workout. They're getting the same stress load, but athlete one might be recovering wonderfully and athlete two might not be recovering at all. And so you have to be able to have that individual window into their, into their body stress resilience so you can adjust their address their training loads, address their rest cycles, address, uh, you know, their, their, their nutrient intakes and, and things like that. So, you know, we came to this from the perspective of starting to look at different ingredients one by one by one by one individually to see what they did on markers such as heart rate variability on markers such as uh, physical performance on uh, it, 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 it was really less about mental wellness and more about physical performance uh, in the early phases of this research and I want to I want to just give you guys a perspective for what we looked at initially and how we came full circle back around to what eventually became mental heart so what you're looking at here is one of our very early studies last year where we're looking at, uh, let, me just, let me just read this title to you. So it's heart rate at baseline, which is before we supplemented, and then, after, at, and then at week eight, post-supplementation. So what we were supplementing here is an astaxanthin uh, extract. So astaxanthin is a, is a particular carotenoid. It's an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory extract that's made by algae. You know, so it's a, it's a, it's a, something that's naturally produced by algae to protect the algae from sunlight. When we eat it, we get an antioxidant benefit. We get uh, an anti-inflammatory benefit. There's some studies to sh uh, suggest that you get a fat burning benefit, that you get a physical performance benefit because of blood flow, because of, uh, because of blood oxygenation. So we were, we were looking at this as a, you know, as a, as a potential ingredient we would use in a, in a performance supplement, like you know, sport nutrition supplement, if you will. And so what we're looking at is submaximal running intensity. We were having people run on a treadmill. That's what you're looking at here. And what you, and what, what, what you see is um, the, the blue is the astaxanthin group. The, the red is a placebo group. And I just want to, this is kind of a busy slide. So I just want to point you in on two things real quick. This is the, the, the aerobic threshold right here. And this is the anaerobic threshold right here. And remember, we're looking at heart rate. And so what we're looking at is what is the heart rate when these subjects reach their aerobic threshold? So aerobic threshold, the way, best way to describe that is that that's the point where, where you can burn fat right up to that point, And then you start to, start to use more, uh, more stored sugar, more, more glycogen. What we showed here is that these, these, these runners, they were, they were physically active subjects. They weren't runners per se. But what they were able to do is at aerobic threshold when they're using primarily fat or anaerobic threshold where they've really reached sort of their, their max, their, 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 their ability to go hard. After supplementation, they were able to reach that at a much lower heart rate. What that's telling us at the same um, speed on the treadmill. So we looked at this a couple of different ways. In, this, in the astaxanthin supplementation group, they were able to either reach the same speed at a much lower heart rate or at the same heart rate, reach a faster speed. So what that means is that this, was, this supplement was helping them be more efficient from a cardiovascular standpoint, right? So, you know, let's, let's say it a different way. Let's take these people off the treadmill and explain what would happen if they went out to run a 5K run. Let's say they had a 5K that they did, you know, that they did on a regular basis and it took them, you know, 45 minutes to do, whatever, you know, whatever the number is we're gonna use. They could either, after, after astaxanthin supplementation, they could either run that same distance faster in a, in a, in a quicker time or they could run it in the same amount of time and it would feel easier. 
And th that's the kind of thing that we're, that we're capturing by measuring aerobic threshold and anaerobic threshold. So no matter which way you, you want to have improved performance, make that thing that you do easier to do or make that thing that you do uh, uh, um, easier to do at a higher level of performance, speed, astaxanthin is going to help you on both, on both ends. And so great, we found a really nice perform a physical performance advantage of this of this astaxanthin supplement but what we also found and this is the sort of you know eureka moment we weren't looking for this necessarily we also found an improvement in global mood state so glo global mood state is one of the ways that we measure overall well-being and you can see here the supplementation group after um, after eight weeks had a much improved, a lower number is a better number on this particular metric, 11% um, improvement in their overall well-being, their overall quality of life in certain ways, okay? So that was a little bit, um, a little bit of a revelation to us, right? We knew we were getting benefits in the heart. We knew that was delivering these physical performance benefits, but boy, did the, I mean, and, and our, you know, our subjects were blinded. This was a placebo controlled, you know, um, double blind kind of, a, kind of a trial, but they clearly knew what group they were in, right? People would just come in and go, oh my gosh, I don't know what a group I'm in, but I feel amazing, right? And, you know, after a while you could, this person felt amazing, that person felt amazing, that person felt amazing. It showed us a trend that once we broke the code, we went, aha, yep, 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 yep. N not only were people sh showing this performance advantage, but they just felt better. And that feeling better could have been a reason for them to have a, have a physical performance benefit. We'll get into that in a little bit. But so there was a psychological benefit in addition to a physical performance benefit. Here's, you know, when we, when we, when we look at these profile of mood states, this is kind of the average of all of these different subscales. So it's great that these people felt better overall, but it's also interesting for us as scientists to try to figure out, well, wh wh why did they feel better? You know, are they feeling better because their energy is higher? Or are they feeling better because their depression is lower or what? And so what we found here was that, you know, they all kind of changed in the, in the direction you would want them to, but the only ones that reach statistical significance that really tells it that, 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 that this is a real finding versus just like, you know, chance or happenstance were fatigue was down by 36% and depression was down by 57%. So this is, you know, you, fatigue makes sense, right? That, you know, if we were seeing these physical benefits, it might've been because their energy levels were higher, you know, energy higher or fatigue lower, same, same sort of a measure. Um, or it could have been because their overall mood was better. So, you know, almost a 60% improvement in how these people feel in terms of their mood and a, a, you know, almost a 40% improvement in how they feel in terms of their energy levels. That's great. But it tells us that the reason they felt so much better was, was because of these two predominant subscales. And that's, that's, that's just important to sort of inform how we're going to use this. Are we going to use this as a, as a mood supplement? Are we going to use this as an energy supplement? Maybe, maybe not, but this is, this is good information in the, in the early days of our product development process. So we went and, and you know, took, took some of those data, pu you know, published them. So out of that research trial on astaxanthin, uh, we, got, we got two, two very nice studies. We got one study specifically focused on the cardiorespiratory benefits, the, you know, the sort of, you know, aerobic threshold, anaerobic threshold, you know, being able to perform better kind of an idea. And then we also got one on this, on this new, really new information around depression and fatigue. Uh, and so, so that was great. That kind of led us to this idea of the heart-brain axis to say, well, look, we're getting a body benefit. We're getting a brain benefit or a mind benefit. How, how, are, those, how are those feeding on each other? How, are, how is one leading to the other? Is it a you know, ch chicken egg scenario, if you will, right? So you know, he, here you can see the conclusions from, from one of those papers about heart-brain axis benefits, you know, heart health benefits around antioxidant effects, fat oxidation effects, endurance effects, uh, benefits around brain health for neuroinflammation, cognition, antidepressant or anxiolytic, this is anti-anxiety benefits, um, and then psychological benefits around depression, fatigue, and vigor. You know, so those are all different things. They're, they're clearly related, but here we're, we're clearly showing heart health benefits 
brain health benefits and psychological benefits. They don't always sort of um, cascade like that, um, you know, connect the dots as, as, as clearly as I'm making it sound here. Um, but but that's, that's why we do this. That's why we do this research to sort of, you know, tease it out. So with that as a background, looking at astaxanthin, uh, we also had some data that's similar to what I just showed you on this ingredient, palm fruit bioactives, but I'm gonna save that background information for, for a little bit later in the talk. Um, so you know, we had studied astaxanthin, we had studied palm fruit bioactives, that gave us some information to say, huh, maybe, maybe we're able to find something really uniquely beneficial here that hasn't been, hasn't been discovered before. So we went in with these methods. Before and after 30 days of supplementation, subjects performed a heart rate variability assessment. So we didn't use these, these bands, right? There's lots of ways we can measure heart rate variability. In some studies, we measure it right on your fingertip. Uh, in some studies, we'll measure it with these watches. With this particular one, we use something from uh, an institute called HeartMath. Some of you have maybe heard of that before. They, they, um, they make some really cool instrumentation um, to teach people about breathing and biofeedback, you know, something you can, you can, you can put on, you know, sometimes it's, uh, sometimes it's on your head, sometimes it's on your chest, depending on what model you get, but you can see your heart wave patterns on, on a screen in front of you on your computer. And by changing your breathing, by changing your thought patterns, by doing some, you know, gratitude work and mindfulness work and things like that, you can actually see your heart rhythm changes and try to get them from one pattern to another pattern and the other pattern being associated with psychological outputs, right? So they make some really cool devices and they do some really cool training programs. They do some really cool research. So we partnered with them to not just use their technology, but have them kind of guide us through how we should use the, the instrumentation, how we should interpret the in instrumentation, all that kind of stuff. So we use something called M-Wave Pro. And we use the profile of mood state. So this is something that my laboratory has been using for years and years and years. It's one of the best ways in healthy people, non-depressed, non-anxious, non-burned out people, to see a psychological change over time in response to an intervention. Um, so, you know, that profile of mood states will give you that global mood number, that overall quality of life number, and then it will give you all those different subscales. And I just explained why it's important for us to know, well, these people feel better, but are they feeling better because of an anti-depression effect or an anti-fatigue effect or an anti-irritability effect, or that just gives us, gives us more, um, more nuanced understanding of what aspect of mental wellness we're addressing here. Um, the supplement was meant to heart from Amari Global. That's what we're talking about tonight. Um, and it contained five natural ingredients previously shown to have heart health benefits. So we had gone into this. So think back, you know, a year ago, 29, middle of 2019, when we started these, these studies. What we didn't have in our product line at that time, we didn't have a heart health product and we didn't have any sport nutrition products. So we looked at that as a team and we said, huh, Maybe, maybe we should, you know, develop something in, in those categories. And there's lots of, there's lots of, um, you know, the usual suspect ingredients out there that we could, that we could go after. But if you've been involved with Amari for any, uh, you know, amount of time over the three years that we've been around, you know that we don't want the usual suspects, right? We, we might use an ingredient that's out there, but we want to use it in a unique way to deliver a unique aspect of mental wellness. So we already knew that these palm fruit bioactives that, have, that had just, just barely come to market um, are, are effective in, in um, normalizing something called redox balance. So this is not just having an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory benefit, but it's getting the cells to also be resilient in the face of, of uh, protecting themselves. So it's not just protecting, it's enabling the cells to protect themselves, which is a is, a, is a, a subtle difference, but is a really, really important difference. So this palm fruit bioactives, I was actually working on this many years prior to us starting Amare. Um, uh, I, I did some entrepreneurship work at, 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 at MIT in, in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And I met some researchers there that were trying to bring this to market. And I said, I have some experience bringing ingredients to market, so let's partner up. They have some great data out of both MIT and Brandeis for these palm fruit bioactives to be effective for 
metabolic benefits like, like diabetes, for neurological benefits like Alzheimer's, for cardiovascular benefits like hypertension and, 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 and um, uh, uh, antioxidant benefits and anti-inflammatory benefits. So it, you know, it's kind of like it does a lot of things across the brain, the heart. It also has benefits for the microbiome that just came out a couple of months ago. So it's doing a lot. And so we're trying to figure out like, where is the best place to enter the nutraceutical market? And we figured this, you know, maybe, maybe this would be a place to, to do it. So palm fruit bioactives was something we were really interested in. And in, in fact, to this day, uh, we're the only company in the world that has launched this in, uh, you know, any sort of a clinically validated nutraceutical product. Uh, you saw the astaxanthin benefits. So astaxanthin, a lot of times is thought of as just an antioxidant, but it has benefits for the mitochondria. So metabolism, it has benefits for some of the things I said before, blood flow and oxygenation and, you know, performance and things like that. You can see that I have it here as antioxidant, but it does a lot more than that. It's thought of as a very unique antioxidant because in a, in a cell, the, the, the structure of astaxanthin enables it to, to traverse the entire cell membrane. So it can be an antioxidant to things that are outside the cell and an antioxidant to things that are inside the cell. And that's very, very unique. Sometimes you have to think about choosing an antioxidant that works outside the cell, like a vitamin C, or inside the cell, like a glutathione, right? But you, you, you actually wanna be protected in all of these places, you know, inside, outside, you know, all the sides, and, and astaxanthin is a very good way to do that. Bergamot is a, is a unique kind of uh, uh, species of orange that is, has great data for lowering cholesterol. Coenzyme Q10, anybody who thinks anything about heart health has heard of coenzyme Q10 before. This helps with cardiac energetics, basically making the heart contract in a more efficient manner. So a lot of times people who are taking coenzyme Q10 are people like congestive heart failure uh, or high blood pressure, or if you're taking any of the cholesterol controlling uh, medications like the statins, those will lower your body's uh, um, um, uh, reservoirs of coenzyme Q10. So you have to supplement in order to get those back up to normal. Otherwise you get, you get cell damage, you get, you get, you get myopathies, which is muscle damage. You get muscle pain. It's terrible, terrible side effects that, that, that you have to supplement coenzyme Q10 to prevent some of those side effects. And then black cumin seed oil. This is used, we actually use black cumin seed hulls in one of our other products, seed fiber, and we use black cumin seed oil in our hemp GBX product because it's a wonderful anti-inflammatory. And so we wanted, to, we wanted to get those benefits here. We now think a year down the road that this black cumin seed oil is amplifying some of the effects that we're getting with some of these other nutrients. So it has benefits on its own, but it also has benefits as, a, as an amplifier of the synergistic benefits of all of these other ingredients, okay? So there's a good reason that we chose all of these ingredients, but we wanted to then study what happens when we put them all together in that recipe, so to speak. And, and, um, and the way that we decided to measure that was to use heart rate variability. So I told you I was gonna show you some other, some other sort of cartoons, some other graphics about what that, what that looks like. So when we measure heart, we can measure heart beats, right? So beat, 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 and we can measure the number of those that you have in a minute, and we can tell you what your beats per minute is, right? That's a sort of a you know, classic, classic way to do it. We can tell you that you have 72 beats a minute. And then if you get in better shape, you have 65 beats a minute. And then if you're stressed out, you have 95 beats per minute, right? We can, you know, that gives us some information. Heart rate variability, though, is looking at the interval of time between each of those beats. And so you can see here that it, it, it's not the same amount of time, right? Let's, let's say we had 60 beats in 60 seconds, right? 60 beats per minute you would think that you could, it would be one beat every second, right? Beat, 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 add 60 of them up in 60 seconds, you know, one, one, one beat per second. But that isn't how it's working. If your heart rate variability is high, that means that there is a lot of difference in the time between beats. That's a good thing. If your heart rate variability is low, that means that the, the, the interval between the beats is consistent, is the same all the time. That's an indicator of stress. That's an indicator of your heart not being resilient and being able to bounce back 
in relation to whatever you're, you know, whatever you're, um, you're encountering, right? So when you look at this blue line, what it's looking at is the, 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 the space interval, the time interval, usually in milliseconds of, of how many, you know, what the, what, the, what the variation is from one beat to the next beat. And there's a couple of ways to measure this. You can measure it from, you know, from one peak to the next or one nadir to the next. And I'll show you how we measure it in a second. Um, that's, not, that's not too important for our purposes, but there, there are different ways to do it. The reason this is important from a perspective of mental wellness, though, is because of this. And this is work that the, that the, the Heart Math Institute has really been on the front, front edge of, which is, if you have, if you have um, heart rhythms that are coming out of the heart and being picked up on, by the brain, by the waves in the brain, the brain waves, if those rhythms are, are staticky, if you will, that's going to lead to incoherence. That's going to lead to um, um, the, them, them being out of resonance or, or, a, or a dissonance is the, is the word that you would use that's going to impair both physical performance and mental performance. So we could think of this, of if, say, here's, the, here's the, the incoherent heart, heart patterns associated with frustration, anxiety, worry, irritation. If we're an athlete, we want to get this smoothed out so they perform better. That athlete is just, as a nice side effect, nice side benefit, they're going to feel better too. And if they feel better, that's going to fuel their performance even more. So there's a direct physiological and a direct psychological benefit of trying to improve the coherence here or improve the resonance. But in doing one, you get the next. So there's a direct benefit and there's an indirect feedback benefit that just gets better and better and better. So what we're trying to do is go from this, this status of impaired performance to this one of optimal performance. And the way that we can do this is we can think good thoughts, right? Part of the heart math training is to get people to use positive emotions, use things like love and appreciation and you know, loving kindness meditations and gratitude meditations and things like that to, from your brain, change your heart patterns, which will then be reflected in better brainwave patterns and virtuous cycle. So you get out of that anxiety, that worry, that sort of rumination, that stress, and which is causing stress in the heart, but that stress in the heart is also causing stress in the brain. So it almost doesn't matter where you start. If you start with the mindfulness and the meditation in the brain and you get a heart benefit, which then feeds back, or if you start in the heart and get a psychological benefit, and feeds back, right? So hope, hopefully that made sense, right? This is what I was trying to say before about the chicken and egg scenario. This is why it just, it, 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 in a lot of ways, it makes my blood boil when people say to me as a nutritionist, and I'm talking about nutrition, they're saying, well, you're just talking about nutrition. You're forgetting about all the other things. You're forgetting about physical activity and you're forgetting about mindfulness. And I'm not, it's just that that's what I'm talking about at that particular time. Same thing when I talk about mindfulness and breath work and, and, and positive affirmations and gratitude journals, which you know, people who got the Amari gift this month got a gratitude journal, all of that kind of stuff. If you thought that that was the only thing that was gonna be effective and you didn't have to think about good diet or good supplementation patterns or good sleep quality or good physical activity, People who think that they can just think their way out of the quagmire that they're in are completely missing the boat, right? I love the fact that meditation and mindfulness apps and things like that are sort of having a moment right now. That's awesome. But people really need to realize that that is just one of the many, many arrows that you have in your quiver or tools in your toolbox or whatever metaphor you want to use. It's just one piece of what we know is clinically validated to take us from where we are to a better place. And this way that we're talking about it, using nutrition to change what's happening in the heart-brain axis is a really, really different way of thinking about it that, that really can synergize with all those other things. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. So 
Here, here's pictures of all these different ingredients that I just talked about. We started with looking at bergamot and then black cumin seed oil and palm fruit bioactives and astaxanthin and coenzyme Q10. And you know, we found all of these different things, right? In all different trials, which I'm not, I'm not talking about all the trials tonight, but you know, we looked at inflammatory cytokines in one trial. We looked at cholesterol in another trial. We looked at, um, we're looking at blood pressure in one that's, 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 uh, that's, that's in a planning stage right now. One of the cool things that we found though, is once we started looking at cardiac rhythms and cardiac electrophysiology, looking at these heart rate variability patterns, we also did some blood work and we found this. We found an improvement in levels of this thing called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. We did not expect to find that. Um, we knew what all these ingredients did, but the synergy of putting them all together led to this. So the reason BDNF gets me really excited is because that is the, that's the neurotrophic factor. That's the hormone that, that stimulates your brain to make new neurons. And so the subjects in our particular trial were, were all middle-aged, right? They should not have been expecting to grow new neurons in response to a nutritional intervention that was targeted at their heart. But that's exactly what we found. And that speaks to this really interesting interplay between what's going on in the heart and going on in the brain. Remember I said back in the 50s, we thought it was just inflammation. And now, you know, 60, 70 years in the future, we know that it's so much more than that. And so, you know, it's, 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 it's nice to be able to peel back, peel back this onion. Okay, so here's what the meant to heart looks like. You know, we talked about all the different ingredients. They're in there for their individual contributions, but the collective synergy of that is really what we were studying in this, in this ACSM trial. So let me talk a little bit about these, uh, about these PFBs, palm fruit bioactives. Um, I'll go through these fairly quickly um, because you, know, you guys can go back and look at them later if you want to. This is something, so a palm fruit, let me see if I have a, I know I have a picture of it. I wanna go back and show you this real quick. Let me see if I can do this. Okay, so here's a palm fruit that you're looking at in the, in the, in the lower, lower right-hand corner of the, of the slide. Um, typically, palm fruit is used, the kernel is to make palm kernel oil. Uh, very, very high in saturated fats. It's used in a lot of processed foods. Not something you really wanna be you know, um, ingesting a lot of on a regular basis because it's so high in saturated fats. The, the, the fruit out here, you can see this beautiful, beautiful color. That color is indicative of the carotenoids that are there. Um, there, there. There are a lot of tocotrienols here, which are like a vitamin E uh, family, kind of, a, kind of a nutraceutical. There are all kinds of antioxidant, anti-inflammatory bioactives there. Um, but the palm fruit is grown mostly around the world to deliver oil. It's a very, very oily fruit. And when you squish it, you get out this, this palm oil, which is in lots and lots of foods. It's in, it's in, a, it's in thousands and thousands and thousands of foods. Um, I actually cook with red palm oil pretty, pretty frequently because it has a really, really high smoke point. So if you're, gonna, if you're gonna fry something, if you're gonna cook something at really high temperature, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great oil to use. But these palm fruit bioactives actually come from a water-soluble extraction. So it has nothing to do with the oil fraction. It's, it's, it's in a sense, it's kind of like the leftover from the people who are making the oil. And so this group at MIT got their hands on it, analyzed it, found some really cool bioactives in it. I'll show you a picture of them in just a second. And then was tasked with figure out what they do. Maybe they do something good and it turns out that they do a lot of good things. So, you know, that's the work that I've, that I've been helping them with for, for a number of years now. So these unique, mo most of what's in there are, are, are polyphenols. There's also some protein. There's also some fiber. There's also some other constituents there. We think that the combination of the polyphenols and the fiber not only have a benefit on what we're talking about tonight, the heart brain axis, but also the gut brain axis that we talk about a lot here at Amari, helping the microbiome send proper signals to the brain. Uh, we already talked about its potent antioxidant, anti-inflammatory properties, and there's already data, like I mentioned before, on the brain, the heart, and health, healthy aging benefits. Um, you know, uh, um, uh, also also metabolism. So here are the really cool. Uh, polyphenols that are here. This are different derivatives of um, shikimic acid. And this is a unique collection of polyphenols that really isn't found in the plant world anywhere else outside of this 
water soluble palm fruit extract. Um, the thing that's cool about this is that shikimic acid also has um, immune system benefits. Uh, the, I won't get into the nuances of the shikimate pathway and all that kind of stuff, but this as a building block is used to make a drug called Tamiflu. Um, it really helps the immune system be more vigilant in certain ways. We did a side project um, at the same time that we were doing this heart brain axis project around heart rate variability. We also did a little pilot program up at a medical clinic in Boston um, with, uh, with, with another one of our medical advisory board members, Julie Burke. Um, and what, what, what she found was she found lung benefits with, with the mental heart formulation. So supplemented some, did, did a lung measurement on people, supplemented them for 30 days with mental heart, found an improvement in lung function, right? So those are just data that we're kind of playing with right now to figure out like, do we pursue that as a lung, you know, kind of a, kind of a supplement? I don't know if there's a market for lung supplements to be perfectly honest with you, but think about this. We're, we're recording this presentation in a time where we're all concerned about the severe acute respiratory syndrome virus that's out there. That's why we're all at home. SARS-CoV-2, that's the virus that leads to COVID-19 infections. Um, if you had something that could help heart function, help you feel better, help with physical performance and mental performance, and have an immune system benefit and a lung function benefit, wouldn't that be something you would be interested in? I, I don't want to even stray into the area of saying that this is going to help bolster your immune system and protect you from, from COVID or anything, any nonsense like that. But just to say that, you know, we do have some preliminary tantalizingly interesting data that suggests that, that there is this, this interplay, not just between the heart and the brain, but the heart and the lungs. Um, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this idea uh, towards, towards the end of the presentation. What we, you know, we've just heard so many testimonials from people about saying, not just do they feel better, but they are performing better in ways that they didn't even expect. W walking to the top of the stairs, walking from the back of the parking lot, not being exhausted at the end of the day. In, in, in my own particular you know, situation with the hobbies that I do around Ironman triathlons and stuff like that, mental heart has become one of my absolute favorite morning routines because I take it and I can feel it when I'm doing my workouts in terms of that, that, that robustness of you able to, you know, keep going and, you know, maintain your endurance and things like that. So anyway, before I go too much further down that rabbit hole, um, one of the, one of the, one of the pushbacks on palm fruit in general and palm oil, you know, sort of, sort of generally is that it's, it, it, in a lot of part of the parts of the world, what they do um, whether you're looking at Malaysia or you're looking at the Philippines or you're looking at certain parts of Africa, there's rainforest that gets cut down, clear cut, so that they can make these palm oil plantations, right? That's not good. The palm industry knows that. They know that people look at their labels and they look for palm oil. And if it has palm oil, they put it down because it's not a very sustainable way to treat the planet. There's all kinds of baggage associated with using any nutrients that are derived from palm oil, unless it's responsibly sourced and there are ways to get there. There are certification programs and things like that. In fact, I've worked with the Malaysian Palm, palm Oil Board to you know, put some of those programs in place and educate people about how you can sustainably source these, but it's like, it's like a needle in a haystack kind of thing. So what we decided to do, we knew we wanted to use this material and to circumvent all of those um, landmine, so to speak, we partnered with a plantation in Mexico that is not only are they not clear cutting any rainforest, they're actually going into fields that have been used for, um, for livestock cultivation for, for decades and going into those fields and saying, this is a, this is a, like a, 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 a fields are basically barren, barren wastelands in terms of biodiversity, right? There's grass, there might be a couple of trees, there's not much else. So they go into those fields and if they're not being used for livestock, they'll use that land 
to plant plantations and putting the in the plantations, whether, whether it's a nursery like you can see here, or it's a full on production plantation, that brings the biodiversity back. It's not, let's be honest, it's not bringing it back to where a rainforest might have been a hundred years ago, but this land has already been, been used for livestock cultivation. Why not bring it back to a more biodiverse space? And so I've been there to visit the plantations to see their, you know, their, their, their sustainability practices. I've been there to meet some of the workers to make sure that they're being treated right. When we think about sustainability at Amari, we think about it from the, from the ingredient perspective. We think about it from the planet perspective. We think about it from the people perspective so that we can feel good about getting this, this, this material and putting it into a product because it's going to, it's going to help everybody, everybody involved. Right. So, um, so there, I won't, I won't talk about that anymore. Um, you know, on the, on the heart health side, we already knew there was a little bit of a benefit here with, um, with heart rate variability. Uh, we certainly added to that, you know, that, that body of body of literature. So we knew there were heart health benefits. There's some brain health benefits. This BDNF is what, is what we discovered 22% improvement in that, in that brain derived neurotrophic factor. And so that's going to be good for growing neurons. And in, in other clinical trials, it's been shown to help with something called synaptic plasticity or neuroplasticity. So it's not just that you grow new neurons, but you can actually over time change the physical shape of the brain. You can, you can take a brain from an old broken down aging brain to a more youthful learning resilient kind of a brain, right? And that's a, that's, that, that's a, that's a process, right? It's not going to happen in 30 days of supplementation like we did in our trial, but we can at least see that we're starting that process by this 22% improvement in the first domino that needs to fall in order to grow those neurons, which are needed to, to lead to this, to this neuroplasticity, which are needed to, to lead to the, to the learning improvements, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we also show this improvement in, in profile of mood states. So people are feeling better. And that's an important distinction, right? There are things that happen in the brain that make the brain work better, focus, memory, you know, clarity, those sorts of things. Those are, those are sort of brain performance indicators. But then there are also emotions, which are certainly things that are sensed in the brain, but the signals that drive those emotions might come from the heart, they might come from the gut, they might come from other parts of the body. So, you know, you could, you could, you could separate those and describe them as brain benefits and mind benefits or brain benefits and spiritual benefits or however you want to describe that, but we measure them separately. And sometimes we can see an improvement in one or the other. Here we were seeing improvements in both. That doesn't necessarily mean that BDNF leads to, you know, less sadness, but they're, but they're certainly correlated in certain ways. Okay. Uh, and then healthy aging. When we were talking about healthy aging, there's all kinds of ways that we can look at this. One way that we look at it, um, and this is in a, a, a separate trial that we did on, on, on PFBs separately, not in the, in the collection of mental heart, right? So we presented these data um, 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 uh, previously. In fact, a, 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 a peer-reviewed scientific publication just came out a couple of days ago, um, collecting these data together. Um, and so what we found here was 140% improvement in that ORP. That's that oxidation reduction potential, the redox balance. So this is showing that the cells are protected, but they're also protecting themselves. And then th all of these inflammatory markers, this is important because as we age, we can get more and more inflamed. It's something that was, sometimes we call it inflammaging because that inflammation leads to our bodies aging faster. And the faster those inflammatory markers, markers go up, the faster we age and the more we go on the downslide in terms of our physical and mental performance. So if we can get that inflammation down, we don't have as much chronic inflammation. We don't have as much chronic tissue damage. We don't have that downslide. We have good, um, good, good, good healthy aging, you might say. Successful aging is the way we describe that. And so we looked at a variety of inflammatory markers and we were able to show 40% reduction, 45% reduction, 104% reduction in some of the predominant inflammatory markers. So lots of really good stuff with astaxanthin, lots of really good stuff with pump fruit bioactives, lots of really good stuff with all the other ingredients. So that got us to these results. When we put them all together in that recipe that is meant to heart, 
This is what we found. Following 30 days of supplementation, heart rate variability was improved 11% using this one way of measuring heart rate variability and 19% using this other way of measuring heart rate variability. So remember I said, you know, when I was showing you the heartbeat kind of a, kind of a graph, we can measure it by looking at from, from this point to this point or from this point to this point. And there, there, there are pros and cons of using one method versus another method. So we looked at a couple of different ones. Both of them showed an improvement. And so this indicates a, 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 an improvement in heart rate variability. Why do we care? Because it indicates a superior autonomic nervous system tone and enhanced stress resilience. This is showing that our body after supplementation is better able to handle and adapt to and respond to whatever that stress is that we put these people under. That could be psychological stress, it could be physical stress, it could be any of the sources of stress. We also showed, so heart benefit right there, we also showed these mood state benefits, right? And I you know, showed, you, showed you when we looked at just astaxanthin, we only really saw significance in global mood, depression and fatigue, right? The other ones didn't pop, so to speak, but here they did. Here we're seeing significant reductions in all the negative mood states. Tension was down 49%, depression 76%, anger or irritability 39%, fatigue 51%, confusion or brain fog 62%, and then global mood state was up 23%, vigor was up 22%. So in that cocktail of ingredients that is meant to heart, we, we see a much improved overall benefit on all these parameters. So you can think of it as we know what astaxanthin does, we know what PFBs do, we know what coenzyme Q10 does, and we know what black human seed does, and we know what bergamot does, right? But when we put them together, we don't just get a collective additive benefit of one plus one plus one equals five, we get something that is much more beneficial than that because we're seeing this rippling across the entire physical body and the entire psychological body or mind, if you want to, if you want to say it that way. So that's what we mean by synergy. Uh, and so, so here's that same data um, that I just showed you on that last slide represented graphically. So here's one way of looking at it, an 11% improvement in heart rate variability. Here's another way of looking at it, 19% improvement in heart rate variability. And here's, here's, the, here's how they're measured. You know, the S SDNN and the RMSSD are, are, are just measured by, you know, by looking at different, different, different parts of that wave so to speak, but they're, both, but, but they're both validated in different ways. Global mood state improving 23%, all these subscales improving the numbers that I, that I showed you on that, on, that, on that result slide. So it leads us to these conclusions, which, are, which I think are pretty, pretty substantial. So our conclusions, supplementation resulted in a meaningful 11 to 19% increase in heart rate variability, suggesting a physical heart benefit. If we just stopped right there, that would have been an awesome trial because then we, we would have something that we could say, look, if you want to improve your physical performance and your stress resilience, go do this. You're going to be able to, your, your body's going to be able to bounce back better with mental heart than without. Okay. Awesome. But we also, because we're the mental wellness company, what does my shirt say tonight? Happy mind, happy body. Exactly. We also looked at the mental wellness benefits. So we also saw improved mood state parameters suggesting a mental brain benefit. This is the first time we were able to ever link those two through a nutritional intervention. So this last part of the conclusion says, while previous studies have shown individual ingredients to improve general heart brain health, these data are the first to show that targeted multi-nutrient supplementation supports the multifaceted psychophysiological heart brain action Access with simultaneous and coordinated improvements in both physical and mental performance. And so that gets people that, I mean, that's, that's awesome that we're able to show that, right? You use this supplement, whether you're using it alone or you're using it as part of the entire gut brain axis, which is our fundamentals pack or the gut heart brain axis, which is our fundamentals plus pack. So fundamentals three products plus mental heart makes it a fourth product. Whether you're using is that just to feel better or you're using that to fuel your physical performance or you're using that to move yourself way up that mental wellness continuum, people will ask the question about this. They'll say, all right, so with all that said, is mental heart, is it for heart health? 
Is it for brain health? Because we have data on that. Is it for mental wellness? Is it for physical performance? And the answer is yes, it's for all of that in a lot of ways. And because of the lung benefits and the potential immune system benefits, this in a lot of ways, not only answering yes to all those questions, it's one of my favorite products because it does something that is absolutely not found anywhere else in the whole nutraceutical industry. It just, there isn't anything that does what this product does. We do it in a really unique way. We've got some, some intellectual property around the formula. We've got some supply chain agreements with the ingredient suppliers. So like you, you really, really can't find anything like this on the market. And so, you know, you could, you could take it for any of those benefits or all of those benefits. Um, I was a little bit lucky. So remember I said that we did th these trials uh, about this time last year um, with, with, with mental heart. But the trials before that with just the PFBs and just the astaxanthins and we, we had done earlier in the year. So I was the beneficiary of having that knowledge and writing up those papers prior to even putting mental heart together. When we finally got the clinical samples for mental heart and we're starting those studies, I didn't want to wait. I started supplementing it with, 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 with myself as a, you know, as an N of one kind of a, kind of a clinical trial. Um, and I, I, I reaped the benefits last year. I did, I did this race, which was the off-road national championships for triathlon mountain bike triathlon. Basically uh, I came in second in my age group, which qualified me to go to the world championships, which is in September this year. I qualified for uh, for the world championships in the long distance triathlon, which is basically Ironman distance. I qualified for the world championships in, uh, in uh, Kona, Hawaii, the, you know, the one that people, you know, recognize as the Ironman. So I'm going to get to do this year, three different world championships because of what I did last year using mental heart. And I, you know, and it's not like, you know, I'm no, I'm no, amazing physical specimen. I'm pretty average on all of those different markers. And I, because of my travel schedule, at least my pre COVID travel schedule, I was on the road a lot of months more than I was home. So my, my, my physical training, the amount of hours that I was able to swim and bike and run was very, very limited. So I needed to make sure I got as much of a benefit out of each individual workout session. And I recovered from it so that I could, you know, build my body and not break down and all that kind of stuff. So mental heart really fueled that resilience and that ability to bounce back and the ability to, to push yourself mentally and physically in a race so that you could you know, you know, win those, win those qualification spots. So, I mean, I, I could not be any more of an advocate and, you know, take what I say with a grain of salt. I'm also the chief science officer here. So of course I'm going to say good things about this product, but you know, we've, we've, We've submitted these data to peer-reviewed scientific journals. We've presented them at peer-reviewed scientific conferences. We've had other scientific experts, you know, look at our data, validate the data. Like this is becoming a thing that just like the gut-brain axis that Amari brought to market in 2018, this is a heart-brain axis is something that we brought to market in 2019. And we're going to be bringing a couple cool things to market in the, in the coming months. But we're always trying to stay on the cutting edge. And the way that we do it is through research and through asking these questions and trying to provide these answers. So with that, I'm going to go back up here and stop my slide share. So you're back to me. Now I should be bigger and you should see happy mind, happy body. I wanted to wear this tonight. And I, we, we're, we're, we're just, a, just barely over the top of the hour. So I'm gonna go in here to the chat room and see if we have any questions. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite you guys to, um, to uh, you know, raise your hand if you, if you have a question. We'll take a couple of questions and then we'll wrap it up. So let's see, uh, what is this one? Um, Okay, so Nikki is asking, you may have already answered this, uh, I was late to the Zoom. Can mental heart be taken by a 12, almost 13 year old? My son is a mild leak in his pulmonary valve, mild case of MPV, and his dad has surgery to MPV. Yeah, so um, there aren't any ingredients in here in, in, in mental heart that would be considered um, medicinal, so to speak. Like the one, you know, the one, um, the one, 
supplement that we have in our product line that we're a little iffy on anybody under 18 taking is, um, is, 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 is our mood plus because it's, um, and maybe I would also say our hemp GBX plus because that's more medicinal in nature than it is nutritional in nature. Um, that's why, that's one of the reasons that we have a kid's version of our mood plus. Um, and so I don't think there would be any problem here. The only issue would be, can they swallow capsules, right? This is a soft gel. So it's not something you could open up like a hard shell capsule and empty into you know, a juice or a smoothie. It's something that'd be, that, that, that they would have to be able to swallow. The dosage is, is, is two capsules a day. Um, I take two every single morning. Sometimes I'll also take two before I go out for a long bike ride or a long trail run or something like that. Um, so, you know, you can certainly dose it that way. Um, and then dosage wise for, for people who are under 18, what we'll typically do is, is, just, is just cut the dose in half, you know, say, all right, if they're under 18, they're a child. Rule of thumb, you know, for a lot of these, you know, a lot of these nutraceutical ingredients is half of a dose. So, a, you know, a 12 year old might take one instead of two until they get up to be about 100 pounds. Once they're 100 pounds, they're more metabolically like an adult and they're, there they could go to two. Okay, so you, you, you can use those as sort of rule of thumb, but I don't think there'd be any, any reason that, um, that a, you know, that a 13 year old wouldn't get, wouldn't get a benefit from this. Okay. Um, so great. So he's over a hundred pounds. So, I, you know, in fact, so he's over a hundred pounds. I know that now start him on one, see how he does for a couple of days. And if he does good, go up to two and, you know, see how he does, see how he does there. Okay. Can it help with osteoporosis? I don't think so. I don't think that there's, well, let me, let me, let me say this. We do know that one of the things that drives osteoporosis is inflammation. We know that if you're over-inflamed, chronically over-inflamed, that can lead to faster bone breakdown, resorption. Um, and we know if you lower inflammation, that, 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 that breakdown can, can slow down and sometimes the bone formation can, can catch up. Um, I do, we don't have any data in, in, in bone metabolism right now. Bone metabolism is actually what I did my PhD work in. Um, so I know the inflammation piece of it, but I... I, I Lowering your inflammation is good for every tissue in your body, including your bones, but I wouldn't promote this as, a, as an anti-osteoporosis kind, of kind of a treatment. Um, someone's at Natash is ask, asking, what was the time frame between the subjects taking the supplements and the test runs? For example, did they take the capsule in the morning and run in the afternoon? So that's a good question. Um, we only measured them at baseline and after four weeks of supplementation. So, you know, there wasn't, we, we weren't looking at sort of an acute benefit of take the supplement, run faster. We weren't looking at that sort of an effect. I think based on just what I hear back from people, just individual testimonials, including my own you know, personal testimonials, I think that there is some benefit there of taking it maybe half an hour, an hour before you go out. That's why I take it before I go on a long workout. If I'm going to go out there for, you know, ride my bike for two or three hours or run for two or three hours, I'll take it right before I go out the door, you know, wash it down with whatever's in my, my, my water bottle, usually energy plus, and I'll reap the benefits of that at some point in the, in that workout. But the benefits that I'm reaping during that particular workout are probably more related to things like blood flow and oxygenation to my brain and my muscles and things like that. I don't think we're seeing acute benefits on inflammation or on, uh, we might be seeing a, a, um, an acute antioxidant benefit, but the real benefits that we're looking at here on mood state, on heart rate variability, really are things that are more uh, um, due to the chronic nature of looking at beginning and then 30 days later. So hopefully, hopefully that makes sense for, for, for what, you're, what you're asking. Um, can it help with high blood pressure? We didn't measure blood pressure in this particular trial, and I'm kicking myself that we didn't based on what we saw. We know that, that astaxanthin on its own in previous trials does lower blood pressure. We know that PFBs, palm fruit bioactives, on its own in previous trials lowers blood pressure. We know that coenzyme Q10 can. We know that black human seed oil can. Um, so, you know, there are ingredients in there that we know have an antihypertensive benefit, but we didn't look at it in our mental heart trial. So I can't say for sure, but if I had to bet, I would say, I would say absolutely, because we're using several of the ingredients that have previously been shown to have exactly that sort of an effect. But 
It's not the kind of blood pressure effect that is driving your blood pressure low. If your blood pressure were sort of, you know, normal range of, or high range of normal, I would expect it to come down to normal. If it's already normal, it might come down to sort of like lower end of normal, but I don't think it's going to push your blood, your, 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 your blood pressure any lower than that, like, a, like what a medication can. I think what the effect of these, of these nutraceuticals are having, because they're normalizing things like inflammatory profiles, is an adaptogenic benefit that really helps your body get to that new level of healthy set point. So you have, you know, that Goldilocks principle, right? Not too high, not too low, just right. So I think, I think that's the effect that you would, that you would see. Let me see. Let me see what else we've got in here. Um, and oh, so somebody else is asking individuals that take beta blockers for a lower heart rate would switch in what recommendations? So, you know, beta blockers are going to be an interesting thing. What, what, what people might find who are, who are on beta blockers to slow their heart rate or antihypertensives to lower their blood pressure. What you might find when you start on something like mental heart is that because you have that normalizing effect of your heart rate, of your heart rate variability, of your blood pressure, of your blood flow, of all of those kinds of things, what you might find is over time, you need to get a readjustment of whatever that medication regimen is because now your heart's doing a better job of regulating itself. And now if you stayed on that same dose of a beta blocker, your heart rate would drop too low. If you stayed on that same dose of a, of a, heart, of a, of a blood pressure drug, now when you stand up from your chair or stand up from your car when you get to wherever you're driving, you might get a little bit lightheaded. You might get a little bit of that vertigo dizziness. And that's a sign that your blood pressure now is being pushed too low by that medication and you need to work with your doctor to get a readjustment of that medication. So we see that kind of thing routinely that once the body starts to work better, you don't need as much of that medication, which is, which is something that everybody should be striving towards. If you can make your, your body work better and you don't need as much of that drug, then ha hallelujah, you, you know, go to a lower dose or go to a less potent version and you know, potentially not have some of the side effects that are associated with those, with those higher doses, okay? So um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully that, that does it. And I think that, and can you, can you take it with blood pressure medication? You can, but with the caveat that I, that I just went through of, you know, as you start feeling better, you know, as you start to notice those psychological benefits, you're not going to notice a change in your heart rate variability. You're probably not going to notice a change in your blood pressure, except for, you know, the lightheadedness thing that I just described. What you will notice is a change in your mood states. You'll notice a change in your energy levels. You'll notice a change in your ability to focus. You'll notice a change in your ability to not be as tense and irritable and things like that. And when you notice that kind of thing, you know, after 30 days, let's say, and you go, huh, I am feeling better. That's your signal to go to your doctor and say, hey, you know, I'm on this blood pressure drug or, you know, sometimes a couple of bl blood pressure drugs at the same time. Is it appropriate? Check my numbers. Is it appropriate for me to go down to a lower dose or drop one out or, you know, whatever the individual case is going to be for you? It's a, always a unique situation, but have that dialogue with your healthcare practitioner so you can figure out what's going to be the best the best regimen for you, but absolutely. But you know, you can, you're not going to see any sort of interactions or interferences, but you will see once your body starts working better, that maybe, maybe you're in a state where you don't need as much of that, of that medication. Okay. So with that, I think that's everything in the chat room. Let's just do one or two, one or two, uh, you know, unmutes. If, if anybody, if anybody wants to go, um, I think it's set so you can unmute yourself. And if it's not, you can raise your hand and I can go in and unmute you. So is there anybody in there that wants to ask anything? And if there's not, if, if, you're, if you wanna just put it in the chat room, the chat room's still open, I can uh, keep looking in there. And if there's not, we can, we can Wanda, let me, let me, I see Wanda waving. Go ahead, you're unmuted. Oh, okay. Hi, Dr. Sean, hi everyone. Hey. Um, just wanted to know if, because I forgot to look, I just got my my package today. Uh, does mental heart have CoQ10 in it as one of the ingredients? Yes, it does. Yeah, and so so the CoQ10 that we use, I I, I flipped by it pretty 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 quickly. Mental Q10. That, what's that? 
I meant to ask you about that too. Okay. So yeah, the, the, the type of coenzyme Q10 that we use is one called AquaCell. And so, you know, we use a, we use a, um, it's a, it's a very, very bioavailable, it's a highly absorbed form of coenzyme Q10. One of the problems with CoQ10 is that it's not very well absorbed molecule. And so sometimes we'll say to people, if you're taking coenzyme Q10, make sure you take it with a fatty meal, make sure you take it with some, you know, some butter or some oil or something like that so you absorb it better. We're able to use this AquaCell version, which is a phospholipid, so that irrespective of what you're having the rest of your diet, you're going to get good uptake into your bloodstream, as good as any of the really expensive coenzyme Q10s that are out there. So we're able to use it at a fairly low level and still get a good bang for the buck, so to speak. Okay. So the ubiquinal form of CoQ10 and the other one that's on the market, because I, I, I knew a lot about that and I had gone to a, uh, a symposium about three years ago in New yep. York City. And they, were, they had a representative and that's how I learned that there were forms of it because yep. of its low absorbability. So you're saying that AquaCell, uh, so it, it, is, is that the brand name or is that the phospholipid from a biochemistry perspective? So AquaCell Aqua is, the, is the brand name of it. So, um, so, we, so we, we combine the coenzyme Q10 molecule with this phos phospholipid molecule to improve the absorption. And so we, we, we actually have some pharmacokinetic data that I, that I, sh I think I shared it the first time I talked about Menta Heart when we launched it last September, um, showing that, that our, the reason we use ubiquinone versus ubiquinol, you know, ubiquinol does have better absorption than ubiquinone, but ubiquinone is, has better stability. So if you could get the absorption and the stability in the same molecule, that would be the best of both worlds. That's, what's, that's what AquaCell does. It uses a stabilized version that is, that is well absorbed. Okay, so we're getting both benefits of coenzyme Q10 in one ingredient. So if somebody were to ask which form of the CoQ10 you are using in mental uh, uh, hard, it would be the ubiquinone and for the, um, for the explanation that you gave in terms right, of Right, exactly. And they, if they know coenzyme Q10, they might say, oh, that's not as well absorbed as this other kind. And you can say, oh, yes, it is. They've been compared head to head and we have better stability. So that one of the problems with coenzyme Q10 is that it, it, if you're using some of the well-absorbed versions, they can break down really fast in the bottle. And by the time you take it, it might be inactive gotcha. anyway. So it doesn't oh. matter if you absorb it well, it's not doing anything. Oh, I didn't know that part. So thank okay. you. Thank you. All right. So I've got a couple of hands up. So let me go here. I'll do that. Let me see Terry. So Terry Spaulding. Hi, Sean. Hey. Hi, quick question. You know, Jim had a heart attack uh, back last year, and he's noticing a lot that the, the heart, Menta Heart, really helps him if he, he starts having trouble with his heart or he gets anxious or anxiety. And, and I just wanted to comment, it seems like it's really helping if someone's had a heart attack or something. It really does help, John. I mean, we feel it does. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's, and that's the, you know, I say this all the time. Like I love the research and I love to be able to show like on average, this is what it does in a population and, you know, show the data like I just did tonight. But uh -huh. I love to hear that kind of stuff, Terry, because like, that's what makes it real. We like, when I can say I use it and I do a race and you can say your husband uses it and he can feel it. And like, like we hear that kind of stuff all the time. And that's what makes the science real to people is that yes. it has a benefit in their life, you know? Oh, it's had a, an amazing, we, we have the nitro, you know, the yep. doctor gave that to us, but we don't even think about it because we've got them in a heart. So it's, it's wonderful. So I just wanted to tell you, we love it. That's awesome. I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you, Sean. All right. And let's see who, uh, Lance. Well, Lane. Lane. Lane's, yeah. the, Lane's the name. How you doing, Sean? All right, Lane. Fire away. Hey, uh, how about for people who've got type 2 diabetes? You know, I heard some things you kind of alluded to in your excellent presentation. Thanks so much for that. But I think, uh, I know somebody in particular, I think it's his A1C. I'm not positive I have that yeah. right, but it's, it's a little high. How does, how does MetaHeart play into this? Yeah, you, 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 so we didn't, we didn't look at uh, blood sugar levels in this particular trial, but that, you know, I know the MIT group that, that, 
that is really doing the, you know, the bulk of the research around this palm fruit bioactive material, they have, and they, I, like in, at least in animal models, they've shown some profound anti-diabetic benefits. And so, you know, the question is like, you know, PFBs have benefits for the brain, benefits for the heart, benefits for your metabolism and your blood sugar control, benefits for inflammation and, you know, the whole aging process. It's almost like it does, it does all of these things. But when you actually drill down to the data, you're like, well, that, that makes perfect sense. It has these benefits at the level of the neuron and the level of the microbiome and the level of the, of the pancreas and et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I, I would, I would give it a shot, but it's not really, it's not really billed as a, as a, as a blood sugar control, you know, sure. kind of thing. Um, Understood. You know, How about, is there another product that we have that might address that? Yeah. One thing that we have looked at blood sugar levels in is, is our project B3. So oh, project yeah, B3 has, that. yeah, it has fundamentals. It has Vita GBX. It has, it has all the GBX foods. We saw in that one, I believe a 6% reduction in blood sugar levels, you know? Awesome. So that's, that's a, I mean, that's, that's a pretty substantial benefit in people who already had normal blood sugar. We're able to get them to the lower end of normal, which is, a, which is overall healthy. Thanks so much. Appreciate okay. it. My pleasure. All right. Let's see. And then Michael Stedgelick. Is that right? I probably butchered that, Mike. Uh, Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. Uh, what it was, uh, it was, it's Stedgelick. You did really well. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, my mom has uh, um, a pacemaker. Would you recommend that for somebody that has a pacemaker and high blood pressure? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, if they're, if they're on a pacemaker, they're probably also on blood thinners. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 the issue here isn't, again, isn't going to be a problem with, you know, drug interactions or drug interferences or anything like that. But because there's a couple of ingredients in here, the, uh, the uh, black cumin seed oil, um, and the astaxanthin might have slight blood, sh uh, um, blood thinning qualities. Um, what they might need to do is get an adjustment to their blood thinner on their next, on their next visit. You know, they'll, they, you know, they probably go in for periodic visits to get their coagulation measured and things like that. If it's getting a little bit too thin, their doctors can just, can just change their level of their, of their blood thinner, lower, lower the amount of blood thinner that they're, that they're giving them. Uh, but I think, I think it'd be great for somebody in that, in that situation. Okay, because you're gonna have you're gonna have heart rhythm benefits, and you're gonna have um, and you're gonna have uh, you know blood flow, you know, uh, cardiac dynamic benefits, which are gonna be be good for overall blood pressure. Okay, all right, all right, everybody, and I think let me see, lower hand, lower hand. I think that's all the questions for tonight. So uh, I'm gonna check the chat room one more time, and. Uh, Marty put in here a comment. I've been taking fundamentals with Minta Heart and lowered my A1C from 7.5. And though I couldn't get the A1C before meeting my endo doctor, she felt it was well into the sixes. Great. That, that, that's, that's awesome, right? So yeah, I really appreciate you, you, you sharing that, Marty. So with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to thank you guys for, for joining in tonight. This will be posted up to YouTube uh, sometime tomorrow. Okay. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.